Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Rancho San Joaquin HOA. This is Mari Fuji, uh, a member of the board. Um, I also have Cynthia Peterson, who is also a, a co-member of the board. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the gavel to Brandy Najim, um, who is the education supervisor and uh, in charge of community outreach. And I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, Brandy? Hi, thank you so much for having us tonight. My name is Brandy Najem. Like Mari said, I am the Community Education Supervisor for Orange County Fire Authority. I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight to present a little presentation about home fire safety. Um, I know that previous to this recording and this presentation, you guys were given some of our safety flyers that talked about cooking fire safety, barbecue safety, um, and some of the other things that we have available resource wise for you guys. So I would definitely encourage you to make sure that you reference that as well. A lot of that information will be discussed tonight and um, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. So tonight we're gonna be talking a little bit about home fire safety. There's a whole range of things that we're gonna be talking through. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started and talk to you guys a little bit about who we are as Orange County Fire Authority first. The Orange County Fire Authority is a regional fire service and we provide um, fire services to 23 cities and unincorporated areas throughout Orange County. We have over 1.9 million residents and we currently have 77 fire stations. We range as far south as San Clemente and as far north as Los Alamitos and emergency response is what we do. It's what we do well, but we also have a lot of additional aspects to our department that set us apart from your traditional smaller departments. One of those areas is our community education and outreach. And that is basically our shop and what my educators and my team does. Basically community education and outreach provides free services and resources for the community. Everything that has to do with disaster preparedness to fire safety, drowning prevention, we have a ready set go program which focuses specifically on areas that are in our wooey or our wildland urban interface areas we also love to come out and train on fire extinguishers we talk a little bit about fire safety and then get hands-on with the extinguishers so you can feel them you can use them in case an emergency does occur and we also have a smoke alarm installation program where we do various events throughout the year um, pre-COVID and are able to come out into the community and do smoke alarm installations for um, areas that have need based on, um, you know, the year that they were built, the residents that are living in the area um, or what we call high fire severity zones. So that's just a little bit about what we do. We also um, immerse ourselves in the schools. We help with station tours and any community events um, that happen throughout the, the county. Tonight, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to talk a little bit about what fire is. We're going to look at the top three causes of fire, which are actually the same in your house as they would be in your workplace. We're going to look at burn safety, and we're going to talk a little bit about some things that you can do around your house to make sure you're prepared if a fire does occur. Things like fire extinguishers, making sure that you install smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms, and why you should take some time to create a home escape plan. So first and foremost, what is fire? Most of us probably remember our days in junior high or high school where we took our science classes and we learned all about chemistry and fire and what it, what it means. Uh, fire is basically a chemical reaction. In the fire service, we like to uh, reference the fire triangle, which basically identifies three different components that you need to have a fire. You need to have fuel, which is obviously something that's gonna continue to burn. You need heat which is what's gonna make the fuel burn, and then you need oxygen or air. Essentially, all three of those components have to be present to have the fire, and if one of those is removed, the fire will traditionally burn out. So that's one thing that we want you to understand just going into this. When we talk about the top three causes of fire, um, I'm sure to some of you, you could probably guess right away what our number one cause is. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what the top three causes are, and then we're gonna break them down a little bit and give you some facts, some statistics, and some safety tips that you can be aware of around your house so that you can be prepared um, and hopefully prevent these fires from occurring. So our top three causes, cooking being number one, 
electrical being number two, and heating being number three. OCFA responds to a cooking fire about once every three days. This week actually is our fire prevention week and our theme for the National Fire Protection Association is serving up fire safety in the kitchen. Um, it is no surprise that with cooking being the top cause of fire in the home that we should be focusing our efforts this week during fire prevention on cooking. Um, from U.S. fire departments, on average, they're responding to approximately 470 home cooking fires a day. Um, obviously, this results, unfortunately, in some civilian deaths. Sometimes it can, um, it, injuries occur because of it, and then obviously there's damage to the property that is a direct impact to the fire. Electrical fires, most of the time we see that um, the fires that involve electrical failures or mal malfunctions, they account for the highest share of civilian deaths and direct property damage. There's definitely some things that you can do, especially in the winter months from about November to February to make sure that you're paying attention to the electrical setups in your home to prevent fires and then heating. What we're really worried about with this is not just the, the port or the stationary space heaters, but the portable ones, the ones that you can you know, put down by your feet, move into every room with you during the cold winter months. And we're gonna take a little bit of a closer look at all three of these so that you can take action to prevent them from occurring. So let's break down cooking fires. Cooking fires are the number one cause of home fires and home fire injuries. Couple things that we want you to remember and a few of the messages that we're preaching this week in uh, partnership with NFPA is to stay in the kitchen when you're cooking. Doesn't matter if you're frying, boiling, grilling, you should stay in the kitchen when you're cooking. And it's very easy for us to get distracted, right? Maybe we have kids, maybe, you know, we've got a football game on, maybe we, you know, the phone rings, somebody knocks at the door. It's so easy for us to get distracted that we oftentimes recommend that you use a kitchen timer. You can use it on your cell phone. You can use the kitchen timer that's on your oven or your microwave, um, or you can use the traditional kitchen timer that you can um, put on top of your, your countertop. You wanna make sure that you guys are alert at all times, okay? Stay focused when you're cooking and always check on your food. We wanna also make sure that you keep a lid nearby when you're cooking. We talked a little bit about the fire triangle in the beginning. Most of the cooking fires that we see um, are a result of unattended cooking left on the stove. So if you do turn around, you get distracted and you notice that a potter pan, or pan is on fire on the stove, we're gonna ask you to do two things. We're gonna ask you to turn off the heat. Again, we're removing one component of the fire triangle. And then we're gonna ask you to put a lid on it, which is gonna remove another, right? We're removing the oxygen when we put that lid on. So make sure that you have something close by. Um, obviously when you're done and you leave the kitchen, you wanna make sure that everything is powered off. And you want to make sure that before and after you're keeping your stovetop clear of anything that can catch fire, your oven mitts, your utensils, um, maybe leftover packaging from the food, and also to make sure that you're cleaning it from any type of uh, food debris or grease that may be left over. You never use your oven for storage. I know for some people it's very tempting, especially for those of us that um, you know, when we get into our elderly years, it's easy to just store that stuff in the oven so it's easier to access. However, oftentimes we forget, you can easy, easily have another fire or an electrical malfunction and something that will increase the ability for you to have a fire as a result. And of course, whenever you're cooking, you need to make sure that you have a fire extinguisher nearby. Couple things that we're focusing on this week, especially if you have kids in your home, is to make sure that you have a kid-free zone of at least three feet. Make sure that that kind of, uh, you can see in the picture there, there's a, almost like a little three foot semicircle. And just make sure that the kids stay free and clear of that, obviously to present, prevent bird injuries. And also make sure that when you're cooking, you've got those handles on the pots and pans turned to the back so that they can't bump, no hot liquid can spill over um, and obviously hurt somebody. Burn safety. Most of the burns that we see <clears throat> are a result of, uh, or are for people that are under the ages of five. And that, that's why that kid-free zone is so important. So statistically right here in 2018, there was roughly 70,000 people who went to the emergency room because of contact burns. There's three different types of burns. We're not gonna go too much into the weeds on this, but we do want you to be able to understand and realize that there are different types. Your first degree burn is typically gonna be pretty minor. It's gonna affect only the surface of the skin. 
Normally it results in some redness and some mild pain. Your second degree is gonna be a little bit more um, severe. Uh, it's gonna penetrate the second layer of the skin. And normally this one's a little bit more bright in color. It's a bright red. And sometimes you can get some blisters associated with it. And your third degree burn is obviously gonna involve all layers of your skin. A lot of the times it's leathery to the touch. Sometimes the skin is visibly charred or, or even black or brown in color. You wanna make sure that you can identify those, <laughs> excuse me, that you can identify those and that you get help um, and have it looked at. You don't ever wanna just assume that it's okay. Most of the fire-related injuries we see are burns. And about every minute, every 60 seconds, somebody in the United States is sustaining a burn injury that's serious enough to require treatment. Wanna make sure, again, I'm gonna reiterate that safety zone. I cannot stress it enough. Make sure that to be safe and to prevent yourself from burns, you're not leaving hot objects unattended. And you wanna make sure that those objects are staying away from counter edges. How often do we pull a casserole out? We leave it too close to the edge. Or you know, we sit down with a bowl of soup, it can easily spill and burn us as well. So we wanna just make sure that we're paying attention to that as well. Electrical fires. What do we need to remember? Uh, your major appliances should be plugged directly into your wall outlet, right? Things like your refrigerator, your stoves, washers and dryers. And you want to make sure that you're getting your system, your electrical systems inspected by somebody um, often, right? Obviously, we're keeping our lamps, our light fixtures, those types of things away from anything that's combustible that can burn. It's especially important with things like furniture nowadays. Our furniture is not the same today as it was you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, the materials that are being used can catch fire and when they do catch fire, they ignite and the fire burns much faster than it did uh, years ago. So you wanna make sure that you're aware of that as well. Couple other things. We wanna make sure that you guys avoid putting cords under your rugs and carpets. Make sure that um, they can't be damaged or pinched by any type of furniture. Couple things that you can look for that you should definitely call an electrician for. And you can do a quick walk around your house too, just to make sure that you guys are doing okay with this and just keep eyes on it at all times. Inspect your outlets, make sure that you're looking at them if there's any type of discoloration. Um, of course, if anything is sparking or smelling funny when you're plugging it in, um, if anything is cracked or broken on that wall outlet, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have an electrician come out and check to make sure that everything is is okay and obviously repairing things as needed heating so not only are we worried um you know about um the bigger heating sources that we have in our home but really specifically we're worried about space heaters you can see in this picture here it shows a picture of the space heater but it also shows it close to um, a couch where actually a fire occurred you really want to make sure that when you're using those you're keeping them three feet away from again, anything that can catch fire, um, any types of you know clothing, papers, uh, furniture, anything like that. And you wanna make sure that you are purchasing a space heater that has, some of them have automatic shutoffs. Those are the best ones for you to purchase in case they do fall over. They will make a really, really loud noise um, to alarm you. You also wanna make sure that you're plugging them in when you're using them and you're unplugging them when you're done. Okay, a couple other things. Make sure that you're plugging them again directly into the wall outlets. Don't ever use an extension cord or a power strip for those space heaters. We just talked about making sure that you, you know, plug them and unplug them when you're using or not using. Of course, we don't recommend that you use them overnight when you're sleeping. And then make sure that you have one that has that automatic shut off. So those are the top three causes of fires that we see in the home. And I want to jump in really quick to some of the things that you guys can do in your home to make sure that you have to double check so that we're proactive about preventing fires. Fire extinguishers. Um, hopefully you guys have one. If not, I'm going to highly encourage that you get one. Most of the home fires that we have are occurring either in the kitchen or in the garage. So it's important to make sure that you have a couple fire extinguishers um, in your home. You should always have one in the kitchen. If you do have multiple layers or levels to your home, you could also put one upstairs <clears throat> if that makes you feel more comfortable as well. They're very easy um, to find. They're readily available. Any type of hardware store, um, Costco oftentimes has them. You can find them at Walmart. Um, and they're relatively inexpensive, ranging anywhere from about $25 to $45. 
um, you should make sure that you are checking it often, maybe once a month, just making sure that you're picking it up and gently tipping it up and down just so that the contents doesn't settle. Oftentimes your extinguishers are gonna have a pressure gauge. In the pressure gauge, you wanna make sure that not only is your extinguisher not expired, but that the pressure gauge is always in the green, okay? If it's expired, but your pressure gauge is in the green, that doesn't mean that it's okay to continue using, okay? So you've gotta make sure that both of those things are lining up. How to dispose of it. Once you use it, you can take it to a household hazardous waste collection site, or if you'd like, you can dump over your trash can and you can use the fire extinguisher, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And as long as it's not under pressure, if you release the pressure and you, you know, use it as a training opportunity, you can let it sit for a day or two and then you can dispose of it in your trash can as normal. So what types of fire extinguishers should we be using? Most of what is available to consumers is what we call an ABC extinguisher. You'll see on this chart right here that the A through you know, K is gonna stand for different fire classifications. So your class A fire is gonna be your ordinary combustibles, wood, paper, cloths, things like that. Your class B fires are going to be your flammable liquids. Grease is a good example of that. Class C fires will be electrical. Your class D fires are gonna be metal. And then of course your class K would be more of a commercial cooking. So interestingly enough, if you're looking at this chart and you're comparing, your A, B, and C fires are going to directly correlate to a lot of the top three causes that we just talked about with that being cooking, electrical, and heating. When do you use a fire extinguisher? You only wanna use a fire extinguisher on a small fire, something like a small trash can or a pot or pan that is on the stove. You don't want to use it if the fire is big. So small fire that's not spreading, in a situation where smoke and heat has not filled the room, and the most important thing is to make sure you've dialed 911 before you start using it, and do not use it unless you have a clear path of escape. Your extinguisher isn't gonna last you forever, okay? So if you start to use it and it doesn't work, it doesn't have enough extinguishing agent in it to get rid of the fire, you are going to have to be able to get out. And if you don't have a clear path of travel, we would rather you just get out immediately and let the firefighters do their job, okay? How do you use a fire extinguisher? We like to use the word pass. It's the easiest thing to remember when it comes to extinguisher use. The P stands for pulling the pin. When you have a fire extinguisher in your house or if you're gonna go out and purchase new ones, I encourage you to look at it. Hold it a little bit so you know what's comfortable and figure out where the pin is, okay? The A is gonna stand for aiming. You wanna aim at the base of the fire. Oftentimes we see people aim to the top where the, the flame is at the very top. We want you to aim at the base of the fire because that's where the fire started and that's where a lot of the fuel and the heat and the oxygen is coming from, okay? The first S stands for squeezing the lever. You're gonna squeeze as you're aiming at the base and the last S stands for sweeping. You wanna sweep from side to side, why? Because we know that the fire is somewhere on the base but we have no idea where. It can be in the center, it can be in the top corner, it can be in the bottom corner. So sweeping from side to side as you're using the fire extinguisher is gonna help ensure that you're putting the fire out and extinguishing it at the origin, okay? Smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have these in your home, okay? Working smoke alarms are going to save your life. They cut the risk of dying in a home fire by 50%. All right, we use the words install, inspect, and protect. Where do you install your smoke alarms? You wanna install your smoke alarms in every sleeping room of the house, outside the sleeping areas, in those hallways, and on every level of your home, okay? If possible, interconnected smoke alarms um, are what's best. That way, when one of them goes off, they all go off, but that's not always feasible, so you can just make sure that you have them in all those places inspecting them. We want you to test your smoke alarms at least once a month. You simply push the test button, make sure that it's working appropriately, and also you can use that once a month test to make sure that you guys are practicing your home escape plan or your home escape drill, which we're going to talk about in a second. Most smoke alarms are good for 10 years. They have a lithium ion battery, um, so you're pretty much good to go. If you have people in your home that are deaf, are hard of hearing, or are blind, there's different smoke alarms that you can get that will either strobe or shake so that they can accommodate their needs as well. 
So don't, don't let that be a reason to not have it. Carbon monoxide alarms are also important. Um, carbon monoxide is a heavier gas. So we always recommend that when you're using a carbon monoxide alarm or when you're installing it, you're installing it lower to the ground. My personal favorite are the plugins. You can also you know, drill them in um, lower to the ground as well. So make sure that you have those on every layer or every level of your home for your carbon monoxide alarms. Home escape plans. Again, I can't stress enough how important it is to have a plan. If you are not prepared and practicing for an emergency, you are not going to know what to do when an emergency occurs. When an emergency occurs, the first thing that happens is we panic. Okay, so it's important that we have that muscle memory and that we're practicing what to do because we will still panic if there's an emergency, but if we've set a plan and we're practicing that plan, our body is gonna know what to do in that situation. So you wanna make sure that your plan takes everybody into account, your kids, if you have pets, maybe there's people that have disabilities or that move slower in the home, make sure you take them into account as well. You're gonna draw out a map of your home or if you go to our website under safety flyers, we have a home escape plan grid where you literally can utilize the grid to map out your home and show two ways out of every room. Okay, whether that be two doors, maybe it's a window and a door, make sure that you identify how you would get out if there was a fire in any room that you were in. You wanna make sure that you guys have, once you're outside, oh, sorry about that. You wanna make sure that once you're outside, you pick an outside meeting place, okay? Let me give you an example. If I'm in the house and I'm in the kitchen, but my son is upstairs in his room, and my husband is in the garage working on the car and a fire happens, he's gonna go out the garage door, my son is gonna go out the front door, and I'm gonna go out the back door. All three of us use three different exits in the home. And the only way I'm gonna know that my husband and my son are safe is if we've designated a meeting place outside the home. It can be as simple as a tree outside your house. It can be across the street at your neighbors. It can be down the street at the corner or if you have a park nearby, that can be your, your meeting spot as well. You have to make sure that you have that designated and that you're practicing going to that spot after you get out of the house. And of course, practice makes perfect, like we've already talked about, at least twice a year, but my recommendation is every month when you test your smoke alarm, let that smoke alarm go off and let that be a reminder to do your home escape plan and to use it as an opportunity to do your drill. So what do you do if there is fire? We have a couple things that we like you to remember, a couple slogans um, that are important in, in that situation in an emergency. Obviously, we want you to make sure you're calling 911, right? Um, best thing to do if you have a fire in your house is to get out and then go ahead and call, okay? When you're getting out of the home, we want you to crawl low and go. Why? Because fire and smoke, heat rises, smoke rises. And a lot of the times, if we're not seeing burn injuries, we're seeing issues with smoke inhalation. So we wanna make sure that you guys are crawling low so that you're not inhaling or smelling as much of that smoke, okay? Once you get out of the house, we want you to stay out. This is hard for a lot of people. They wanna go back in for belongings. Maybe they have a pet that's inside. Maybe they can't locate one of their family members. Um, obviously there's panic and your first instinct is to just run back into the house. We're going to tell you to make sure that you stay out of the home. Our firefighters are highly trained to come on scene and make sure that they do everything they can to preserve life and then property. The very first thing that they're going to do is find where you guys are and ask if anyone else is in the home. Okay. So trust that they're going to do their job and make sure that you guys get out and stay out. Another phrase that I want you guys to remember is close before you doze. Oftentimes we don't realize that fires can occur in the middle of the night. So close that door before you go to bed. You can actually check out, you can Google close before you doze after this presentation and see a full setup of a bedroom that had a closed door when a fire occurred in the middle of the night and a bedroom that didn't have that door closed. Closing that door is gonna help slow the spread of the fire, which is gonna give you more time to, fight, to figure out how to get out or to call for help, okay? So always make sure that you close before you doze. If you do get stuck inside your house and you can't escape using your two planned escape routes, we're gonna tell you to make sure, hopefully that the door is closed, right? You can check the door 
by using the back of your hand. If it's hot, we're gonna advise you to keep the door closed, okay? If it's not, then you can go ahead and gently open the door to see if you can get out. Let's assume in this situation, you test the door and the door is hot. You're gonna stay in the room and you're gonna try as best you can to get sweatshirts, sheets, anything you can to put at the bottom to kind of seal off the door, okay? Um, best thing that you can do is to grab something that's light in color, anything, a shirt, a hat, whatever, a light color. Try to stand by the window and you can wave that. We're gonna ask you not to yell out until the firefighters call out to you just so that we can make sure that you're not breathing in more smoke than you need to and panicking yourself, okay? So we talked a little bit today about the top three causes of fire being cooking fire, electrical fires, and heating. We talked about why it's important to have a fire extinguisher, where you should install your smoke alarms and your carbon monoxide alarms, and why it's important for you to have a plan, okay? Don't wait for the emergency to occur for you to have a few minutes with your family and to take time to plan, okay? For more information, you guys can visit us on our website at ocfa.org. There is so many resources available. If you click the safety tab, there is a spot underneath there where you can locate all of our safety flyers. There's also information strictly on fire safety, strictly on disaster preparedness, strictly on drowning prevention, and we have a new kids corner that we're really excited about for preschool and elementary school aged kids to help them learn a little bit more about our main campaigns. There's also a phone number there for you guys to call. If you should have any additional questions, we are here for you. We are a fire department that serves our community. So whatever it is that you guys need, we want you to feel comfortable enough to reach out to us and let us know how we can help. Hopefully this presentation was informative. Hopefully you learned something new tonight and hopefully you can take a couple steps to make your home safer to prevent a fire. Thank you so much, Brandy. Absolutely. Um, and so we'll go ahead and open it up for a Q and A. Um, I'll go ahead and start off. Uh, I do have one question. Sure. Um, so we live in a, a condominium uh, a community mm -hmm. in which each home um, has at least one uh, balcony uh, mm -hmm. made of wood. And I'm a little confused on what are the um, state or county fire regulations concerning barbecues. So, you know, uh, open fire charcoal barbecues or propane barbecues. Um, but can you give a little bit more information on what we are allowed to do as far as barbecuing? Um, I can't speak a whole lot to, we have a, a completely different department within Orange County Fire that deals specifically with regulations on things like barbecues, fire pits, um, those types of things. Those resources should be available on our website as well. Um, the best that I can do is just to make sure, kind of like what we were talking about with cooking fire safety, if you're barbecuing, you want to make sure that you're utilizing those same um, safety tips, that you're staying close to the barbecue, that you're aware of where you're barbecuing so that you're not, you know, by anything that can catch on fire that's combustible. Um, anything that we talked about that deals with cooking fire safety can definitely be applied to the barbecue setting. Um, but as far as specific rules and regulations for condominiums versus single family homes, those types of things, you would have to um, speak with our prevention department a little bit more about that. Okay, so uh, would you be able to send me the email contact and then we can follow up on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brian Healy, who um, I'll send you his contact information again. He is the uh, deputy fire marshal over our prevention side. Um, so he would definitely be your contact for that and I can get that to you. Okay. Um, does anybody else here have any questions? Um, all you have to do is unmute yourself uh, mm -hmm. in Zoom and uh, feel free to speak up and ask a question. And okay, well, it looks like uh, if nobody has any questions, um, I'll go ahead and uh, 
end this uh, Zoom meeting. And but I would like to thank you, Brandy, for your time um, in educating us. I learned quite a bit actually, and I think I'm going to go down to Costco and look for a a, a fire extinguisher myself awesome. in the kitchen. <laughs> yes, please, please do. It's so important. Okay. Um, well, anyway, well, thank you so much, Brandy. And just for those of you who joined late, I've been recording the session. So I will be posting the recorded version of the recording of the Zoom meeting, and I'll be sharing it out with all of our residents um, on our HOA website. So again, thank you so much, Brandy, for, um, for giving us a, this really helpful uh, education here.